Good evening, everyone. Alicia Barrett here, along with my colleague, Chris Spear. Hello, everyone. Hi, Alicia. How are you tonight? Very well, thank you. Beautiful day. Just getting us set up on Facebook. We'll, uh, we'll start here soon. Okay. It's going to be an interesting night. We're going to taste through some Ribera del Duero wines, uh, Tempranillo-based stuff, for the most part, uh, with a little extras thrown in occasionally, but uh, mostly all about the Tempranillo, locally known as uh, Tinto Fino or Tinto del Pais. And uh, there's some good wines here, so I'm, I'm ready. All right. Well, uh, I am as well. And yes, uh, as Chris mentioned, we are heading to Spain today, a country that has more acreage under vine than any country in the world. The vine has been cultivated on the Iberian Peninsula for centuries. And in the last couple of decades, we've seen many of Spain's classic wine regions revitalized, along with uh, rising interest in new regions. So for those that like wines that are rich and bold in their flavors, we hope you're watching because we'd like to introduce you or remind you of Ribera del Duero. Um, I'm speaking to you folks that love Napa Valley, love Bordeaux, love Brunellos, uh, Ribera del Duero is a region that produces powerful wines, as Chris mentioned, from Tempranillo, uh, but with this old world balance and elegance that we really think you'll enjoy. So uh, some great wines ahead of us. And uh, just to set the scene here, we have a, a couple of slides. And uh, here we are, kind of you'll see in the north, kind of central part of Spain, situated along the uh, River Duero. And we see about 70 miles of vineyards here. And the first winery, Chris, uh, late 19th century, I believe, right? Vega Cecilia? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think around 1864 or so they were founded. Um, I mean, we're talking about, uh, you know, the American Civil War was going on. So that was quite a long time ago. Um, and they, of course, are the, the flagship, the standard bearer for the region. Um, and the wines, uh, particularly the Unico, is very, very expensive and incredibly complex, almost beyond description. But they do make some less expensive stuff and have so own some other properties. So there are ways to taste uh, things that are under the Vega Sicilia umbrella that you don't have to spend four or $500 for, which is nice. Uh, I, I'd say. Uh, we're, and we're also going to be talking about um, Pingus uh, later on, which we're going to kind of taste a little bit of what they can offer to, at a, a, a lower price point than some of their higher end wines as well. Uh, what's unique about this area, firstly, we have kind of a lot of sandy soils, which I'm going to show you here in a second on a photo, but it's an extremely continental climate. When you say that, it means we have very hot summers and also very cold winters, and so much so that frost can be a major concern here. We are drinking actually a, a few wines from the 2017 vintage. Uh, and in that year, they actually saw about a 50%, some did, so about 50% reduction in their crop due to frost. Uh, so they do need to be careful about that here. But the big, the big part uh, that we love about Ribera del Duero, the refreshing acidity that kind of stays with all of this fruit concentration in the wine. And a lot of that is due to this high elevation that we see. And this large diurnal range, this large change in temperature in between daytime highs and nighttime lows because of that elevation. Oh, excuse me, yeah. because of that elevation. Absolutely. And in, in some places, it can swing as much as 50 degrees from day to nighttime temperatures, which is dramatic. And it, it really does serve to uh, preserve that fresh acidity that you find in these wines. Yeah. And so we're talking Tempranillo. And so we're gonna kind of start tasting here. If you are tasting along, we're gonna start with the 2018 Pruno here. There we are, um, from Via, uh, Via Crisis. And that's, yeah, 2018 Pruno. Start with that one, we're gonna work our way through. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're talking Tempranillo here, minimum 75% by law. As Chris mentioned, some producers will throw in, you know, kind of 10% of Cabernet, which we're going to have in our next wine. Some might throw in a little Garnacha. Uh, many, though, are 100% Tempranillo. Uh, so with yeah. Tempranillo, um, 
you know, how would you, a lot of people think about other regions and saying Rioja being one. Chris, how would you advise some of our customers what they can expect with this expression from Ribera del Duero? Yeah, absolutely. Speaking in, in generalizations, I would say that um, starting with Rioja, you have very, very classic uh, expression of, of Tempranillo that can be very full bodied in certain people's hands, especially if they're using more modern techniques and French, new French oak, unlike you know, the, the traditional uh, American oak barrels. But when you go to Ribera del Duero, uh, the clone of Tempranillo here, especially the, the um, old clone that's been in the area for a long time called Tinta del País, tends to have a, a thicker skin and produce a, a much richer, um, more uh, intense wine. And uh, if you want a, a continuum, uh, I would say that uh, another region that, that grows Tempranillo, Toro, where they, they call it te, uh, Tinto de Toro, um, the wines get even bigger. Um, so, but I mean, there there's a, a lot of crossover too. So that's just a generalization. The other thing I would say about the wines here is, as you mentioned, 75% uh, minimum Tempranillo and Vega Sicilia really set the tone for what the uh, appellation was going to allow when they uh, it became a DO in, in 1982, which is pretty recent. I mean, it's a, a young area for uh, as far as being officially recognized goes, but a long history of growing. But Vega Sicilia, you know, the people who opened that came from Bordeaux, so they brought Cab, Merlot, Malbec, and these are this is really why um, these are allowed in here with a little bit of Garnacha and a white grape too. So there's something called Albio. It's uh, grown there. And just a, a couple points here on this slide, uh, those watching, um, you know, it really kind of saw a rise in popularity, especially because it's proximity to Madrid. So you get a lot of the fine dining um, in the city that starts to bring in these wines. But a third of the vines are over 50 years old. As the vine ages, the vigor and um, kind of the yields all come down, which means more concentration in the berries that are produced. Uh, and so that really speaks to the style, I think, coming from the region. And it is a collection of mostly kind of small family-owned wineries. There are, of course, the big ones, uh, like any place, but uh, pretty small in terms of um, kind of the average producer. And we see how popular it's become. Nine wineries, as Chris mentioned, when the deal was founded in 1982, somewhat recently, and now over 280. So. Uh, it's attracting a lot of interest uh, across from, you know, from the Spanish, but internationally as well. Here's just another photo for you showing these bush vines, showing uh, these kind of sandy soils, oftentimes with kind of this kind of pebble um, and a little bit of clay in there as well. Uh, so just a, a beautiful place. And uh, before we get to the wines, I'll just uh, throw up a little bit um, on aging legislation for the DO in particular. Um, actually, none of the wines that we're tasting today uh, kind of specify this on the label, but some do. And uh, Chris, do you wanna speak a little bit kind of why a producer may or may not include it on the wine? Sure, um, you know, you may be um, a very traditional producer working within uh, this kind of regime, which is very, very similar to what Rioja does, the same kind of breakdown, uh, mandatory minimum aging in uh, barrel and then also in bottle uh, afterward. However, um, there are lots of people who just don't want to be tied down to those things. So um, you might just uh, forego using any of those terms and make the wine you want to make and age it in oak as long as you think it needs to be aged in oak rather than some preordained uh, amount of time. And, you know, and, and then, you know, there the whole idea of these things in the past was um, the Spanish model generally is to sell you wine that's ready to drink. Um, a Rioja in particular loves to, you know, turn things out when they're ready to go rather than uh, requiring you to sell it at home, which is really convenient. Um, but not everybody wants to do that. So, um, you know, American oaks, traditional, but you might use small French barriques and only age it for so many months and feel that that's enough. So th there are lots of reasons why you might not follow this exact regime. 
Yeah, and it's important to note as well, this is by no means um, kind of a hierarchy. Just because uh, a wine has kind of the Reserva label and you see it next to a Crianza, it's just gonna be a kind of a different style of wine. Um, there aren't kind of further specifications that come with that Reserva in terms of lower yields and so forth. So um, it's really about style. And so uh, whether it has that on the label or not, finding kind of a producer you like and their kind of approach to time and oak, I think is most important, not kind of thinking that um, Grand Reserva is necessarily the best compared to just a Reserva or Crianza. Different, different wines for different meals for different times and so forth. Uh, so, uh, but that is the legislation, so important to know. And uh, here are the wines we're gonna be tasting tonight. Uh, so yeah, as I said, uh, we'll start out with the Pruno here. Um, this is 90% uh, Tempranillo uh, with a little bit of Cabernet uh, thrown in there. We'll come back full screen here. There we are. Uh, so what do you think about this one, Chris? So I haven't tasted it yet, but the first thing I notice is, is there's definitely a uh, soil like minerality floating yeah. right on top of this wine for sure. But then there's some, some really nice steep fruit. This winery happens to be directly adjacent to the legendary Vega Sicilia. So, I mean, how could it be better situated? Um, I don't know if we, if you remember the map, but there's, there's a little stretch uh, on the western end of uh, the Appalachian where, where there are a whole bunch of uh, concentrated producers where um, you'll see a row of just famous names. Um, and then other areas are more sparsely planted, but this comes from right in that, what they call the Golden Mile in Ribera del Duero. So Vega Sicilia, Pescara, um, all of these famous names. And uh, let me taste. Okay. Uh I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, as soon as I went into the wine, uh, yes, we get kind of um, all these pretty red fruits, but crushed gravel and like this dried clay element immediately yeah. came out. And it, I, I just, you know, when we talked about that kind of old world elegance, I think that is kind of one example of how well the fruit, the earth, the minerality um, is balanced in this wine. It's fermented in stainless steel. And it's just aged for 12 months in second and third use French oak barrels. So we're not getting kind of much flavor, just a little bit. Um, I think also I can get a little bit of that Cabernet just through an herbaceous quality in the wine, ever so faint. Uh, not as much kind of adding kind of black fruits, I think. Uh, we're still mostly in the red fruit camp, but I think it's a really pleasant wine. I, I agree. I think, I think it's, uh, it's surprising how much influence the Cab actually has on the nose here. Um, that was the other thing. It, it was number one mineral. Number two, if I didn't know, I would think there's got to be a little cabin here for the very reasons you said. And uh, I would go on to say that you're right uh, in that I also believe this is a very red fruit oriented wine with bright acidity, really uh, medium body. It's not weighty or heavy. It's elegant. It's got structure. Uh, particularly, you know, the structure in this wine, there's a little bit of tannin, but structure surrounds the acidity, I think. That's yeah. the, the real backbone of the wine here. Yeah, it, the, the wine is completely framed by the acid mm -hmm. in your mouth. Um, the tannins are, are much more kind of round and, and supple, not um, coarse or not fine grained. They're just, um, they kind of fill out the mouth, but they don't define it. Yeah. I think this is, a, is such an elegant wine that you could you could easily drink this with like uh, chicken even. I don't think it's too big for that, but I also think it would handle like some of the local specialties really well. Like uh, they, they do something in the area called cochineal, which is uh, a whole roasted suckling pig, really crackly skin and super luscious meat. This kind of acidity will just cut right through that without overwhelming kind of the slightly sweet and, and juicy meat. I, I think uh, it's really, really nicely done. So there you go, folks. Our uh, one, uh, food pairing for this wine is suckling pig. Uh, so get at it. Uh, yeah, go, go get one. <laughs> um, and, you know, speaking of, of food, Chris, I think you actually, we encourage people to prepare some tapas to have with us tonight. And Chris, our resident chef, has done just that. 
Uh, Chris, tell us about what you have. I did. So, you know, I, I was in this area uh, several years back and uh, I ate it in Segovia and I ate it at a place that's specialized in these roasted, whole roasted meats. And I had um, a roasted goat and roasted lamb. And it was just such a great pairing with Tempranillo. Like goat is not that common here, but I, I personally love it. But uh, lamb is very popular here and there. And Tempranillo just, it, it, it's made for lamb, I, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, so instead of roasting a whole lamb, I made just some uh, little lamb chops. Let me see if I can. Yep, there you go. Yes. So. I, I love that you prefaced this before we got on here tonight and said you made a very easy topics to share. <laughs> I did. The, the thing that, that annoyed me most about making this today was that I just got the lamb chops and the butcher told me they were going to be Frenched, which means, uh, here, I'll show you. Not to have too long of a, see how the, the bone is totally naked there? Yeah. So you can, this is a good, like, little appetizer thing because you can hold it. Um, you could even pass these um, if you wanted to, but their definition of Frenching was to have like, uh, you know, a quarter inch of the bone stripped. So I, I made them at the last minute. So I spent time stripping those bones down to make them look pretty. But what this is, so I wanted the flavors of, of the lamb, but what I did was I made it kind of in a, um, I'm going to put a little olive oil on them too. Okay made them in a kind of a Moroccan style, which of course there's plenty of Moroccan influence throughout Spain and vice versa. They're right across the Strait of Gibraltar. So I crusted these in a seasoning blend that, that's very typical in the area. It's, uh, and I use some Spanish flair too, of course. So there's some smoked paprika in here and uh, coriander, cumin, garlic, um, cinnamon. Uh, and then I a uh, little bit of lemon zest and um, some fresh cilantro. So I, I pan seared these. Normally I grill these, but I pan seared these about an hour ago, and they're down to room temperature. But I'm gonna I'm gonna take a bite of one if you don't mind. See please, how it goes. Please do. Um, Viviana, who's watching, is uh, loving it, and I'm sure kind of wishes she could have a lamb a lamb chop there with you as well. Uh, and that's right, a wonderful thing. Too. Um, the, you know, as you're kind of commenting on those, all those spices that are so common in Spanish food um, and in North African food as well. Uh, but Tempranillo kind of on its own um, and actually all of these wines brings a spice to, to the wine. And, and it's a little bit of like this sweet spice that I think kind of is inherent with the grape variety. And you shouldn't be afraid to kind of really marry that together with your food and accentuate it. It'll bring it out in the food that you have, so. Yeah, I, I failed to mention that, but that was the reason I decided on this preparation. I, I really like it, number one, because it's, it's delicious, it's, it's spicy, but it's not hot. Um, you know, it's just a lot of aromatic spices. And I always, or not always, but a lot of times with Rivera del Duero, I get this kind of exotic spice note in the nose. And I thought, you know, if I could bring the, the lamb, the spice and the wine together, that this would, work famously. And I, I'll tell you, um, the Pruno does just fine with it. Okay. It's really good. <laughs> okay. Well, folks, we will put Chris's lamb recipe on our blog post. Um, and let's, Chris, if you can save a bite for lamb for every wine, and we'll give our final verdict. I can do that. I, I did yeah, three, okay. so. Okay. And I only so took one tiny Which bite. one uh, goes best with that lamb dish? Uh, so let's let's move on. And I just want to highlight, all these wines are around the same alcohol content. They're about 14 and a half give or take a couple um, tenths of a uh, percentage there. But yet, uh, and as we'll discover in the remaining three, but even just in the Pruno that's 14 and a half percent, you, there's no like warmth going on at the back of the palate. I mean, you, you, you feel that it's there and it's giving some body to the wine, but uh, it's, it's very much in balance. And I just want to point that out. Some people look and they see 14 and a half or so and might might think, oh, it's going to kind of give a little burn and so forth. If the winemaking is right and the fruit condition is right, um, everything should be in balance. So, um, I think that's right. absolutely true. Yeah, it's it. Uh, they they do a really great job of maintaining that fresh acidity despite yeah. getting good alcohol levels. So, yeah, which is you know it's hard to do because as you ripen fruit on the vine, 
over your kind of summer months, right? And into the fall, your acid starts to fall as your sugar accumulation goes up. Uh, so it's really quite an art for a winemaker to decide kind of that optimum picking date and when they think there's enough sugar, but they don't want to leave it on the vine too long. You know, no one wants this kind of really jammy, overripe uh, wine that has no acidity left in it. Uh, so yeah, all right. We'll move on from that to our next wine here. <laughs> We're gonna do the Antidoto next, Chris. There we all right. are. All right. Very good. Um, so very memorable label here. We got these kind of colorful stones on top. Um, this, we're heading kind of to the far east of Rivera del Duero here, much less populated. Chris mentioned kind of, did you say the Golden Mile there earlier? Yeah. We're now quite far away from that um, in Soria. And uh, there's, well, I'll let you taste it, Chris, but I think there's just such a purity of fruit here. And we get a lot of elevation and some of the biggest diurnal shifts that we alluded to earlier here. So really fresh styles of wine coming from the east part of Rivera del Duero. Yeah, I already snuck a little taste and, and you're you're really right on there. Um, the, the winemaker here, um, his family owns a winery in Chinon as well. So, you know, he's used to handling grapes that are gonna have bright, fresh acidity, uh, you know, um, so, and I think he does it well. Yeah, Soraya is about as far east as you can get and it is very high elevation. So yeah, it's cool and it definitely, um, yeah, I mean, you mentioned jammy before. That, that this is the furthest thing from jammy you can get, you know? Yeah, I think the fruit is a little bit kind of darker in quality. I almost get a hint of kind of this cocoa, nothing kind of very overwhelming, but I think it's there. Um, also kind of a red licorice, uh, a peppercorn, and I, it's a little bit more of a rounded body to it. The tannins have a little more personality. Um, I think the last one, they're a little bit finer uh, than the than the Pruno, uh, but lovely. And this wine saw nine months in uh, 600 liter barrels. So very, very large barrels uh, to kind of, you know, minimize that contact. And on really old kind of sandy soils, I believe they're organic, um, at least organic, but maybe biodynamic. Um, yeah, I think he's know. working toward biodynamic. Right. And, and, and you know, those sandy soils are the reason he's got, he's got some very old vines, pre-phylloxera vines. And phylloxera famously just doesn't do well in sandy soils. So you've got sand, you, you have a good chance of, of getting some very old vines. And it, it crops up throughout Europe. And then of course, in, in various places in California and Washington, where uh, soils are like that. But um, yeah, really, really nicely done. And I, I think you're right. This is where the spice starts to come in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the last wine, I didn't really get much spicy note out of it, but this one, definitely there's a little black pepper, a, maybe a little, even a little smoke. Yeah. And uh, really nice and, and fresh. It, it's, you know, that's a word that I would apply to it. Yes. So how it, um, let us know how it is with the lamp. Mm. You, I see you finished that glass off. I almost forgot. <laughs> Can't no, forget I, the lamb. No. Um, and you know, it's not surprising that uh, a lot of Spanish wines have <clears throat> this elevated acidity and especially here in Rivera, Del Duero. And, in, and when you think about Spanish cuisine, we also associate it uh, generally with some higher acid ingredients and, and foods. And so, as you've heard us talk about before, that's what makes a happy marriage when your wine has equal or greater acidity than your food. So um, I've done it well. All right, Chris, verdict on the lamb. It's, it's also really good. I'm gonna, I have a, a prediction that I'm not going to find that's not a wine that's not gonna work well with these. I've got just a little bit of lemon zest in there, okay, which okay. is playing off of that acidity nicely. Um, yeah, delicious. Well, we will force you to pick one. We can say they all work, but we will force you to- <laughs> well, let me get through them all. One at the end. All right. Yeah. Uh, so our next wine here, and um, this is the one I mentioned earlier that we're kind of um, dabbling in uh, uh, with a producer that makes a very, very expensive wine, Pingus. Uh, but we're trying the Pingus PSI. There we are. You, and you know, you'll see it by that kind of bush vine and all the roots that are appeared on the label. Um, this is 2018. This is produced by a Danish winemaker, Peter Sissek, who moved to Spain 
1993. And he was working on another project. He fell in love with the old vines in Ribera del Duero and decided to make his own wine, and which he calls Pingus. And I did not know this actually was named after his childhood nickname. That's yeah, that's right. It comes from. So uh, yeah, aged in concrete tanks, uh, large oak vats and old barrels. So, you know, yet again, we're kind of seeing a really restrained use of oak here. Uh, you know, kind of gone are the days of really heavy handed um, oak usage. Uh, so, yeah. Here's yeah, uh, there's no doubt that uh, Peter Sisek has, has dialed back the oak over the years in the Fingus project. Um, there used to be a lot of new oak in some of them, especially in the main wine. Mm -hmm. uh, I think at one point he was even doing a 200% a new oak regime where, where he'd rack from new oak barrels into another set of new oak barrels. But uh, I think like a lot of people, he's realizing that you've got to really moderate that. And even if you have a very intense wine, um, you know, that much oak is, is hard for any wine to absorb. Um, I would also say, yeah, he, he came there in, in 93. He was working for uh, Hacienda, Hacienda Monasterio, which is another great winery right there. And um, yeah, I think he just fell in love with this place and, and the vines here. And uh, yeah, he skyrocketed to um, one of the most expensive wines in Spain in, in no time at all with Pingus. But th this, uh, the other couple other little notes, uh, this is called Psi, as in um, the uh, Greek alphabet letter Psi. And if you, if you hold that bottle up, you can see that he, uh, he puts a um, bush vine on that looks like the letter Psi. So oh, that's, yeah. that's the little uh, thing he's doing there with that. Kind of nice little symbolism. I, I'm not sure what, what exactly that means to him, but uh, it is the 23rd letter in the Greek alphabet. So uh, maybe further in the alphabet to him represents older vines. <laughs> I don't know. We'll, we'll go with it. <laughs> but it. Ladies and gentlemen, that is not a fact. That is, uh, that is not Chris, a fact. That is uh, Chris's speculation. <laughs> Pure speculation. But what, what is a fact is, and, and something that is really great about this guy is um, this is his entry level. And, you know, he has his own home vineyard to make Pingus, but um, he sources this wine uh, all from local growers. And most of it comes actually, even though he's located um, down by this Golden Mile, most of this fruit comes from the east in that higher elevation area like La Hora and, and places like that. And um, his goal is like, okay, I'm an outsider. I came in here and I'm very successful. And the Appalachian uh, uh, Dio Ribera del Duero has become world known, um, but he doesn't think it's necessarily lifting all boats. So he's doing a very gentlemanly thing and giving good prices for good quality grapes from very old vines to people who have lived there, you know, their whole lives and, and deserve to uh, have some recognition and a little money in their pocket too. So I think that's very cool. I love that. Um, yet another reason to buy the wine. Yeah, indeed. Uh, I think we've kind of crossed, crossed the threshold here. The first we kind of mentioned, the first two wines were kind of more in this medium bodied camp, I feel, maybe even medium plastic antidote, but now we're, we're into full body here and kind of into a, a richer, kind of more succulent fruit to it, really kind of dark red fruits. I think we're even flirting with some kind of plum and some black raspberry and so forth as well. Um, again, that sweet spice, the finish is very long, but what uh, you know, stands out, which isn't surprising, but the acid is still so zippy on the wine. And you just kind of, it, it's, you know, not exactly what you would think when you have the, the level of ripeness in the fruit and the, and the weight of the wine, but it's there and it's beautiful. Yeah, I agree. This is one of the better si uh, size I've ever had. Um, I'm just going to say that right now on first taste. It's pretty remarkable um, in its balance. And I, I think there's a, a pretty good dollop of Grenache in here, which is not a high acid grape, but it does lend a little alcohol and some of that richer red fruit note. But the, the red fruit is, is totally overtaken by those, those blackberries and plums and stuff. And uh, I, yeah, we're, we're on a, an upward trajectory here for sure. This is good. 
Yes, and you know, for those looking for uh, kind of holiday gifts or uh, you know just any kind of gift giving here, um, always kind of a fun story. I hope we've given you a few things to share about Fungus, about the winemaker um, himself, and kind of you know. You can talk about how expensive uh, Pingus is, but oh, here, and, and here's a little taste for you. And they're kind of entry level, but lots to share and really, really quality wine making and a staple in Ribera del Duero. So uh, Chris, we'll let you get into the lamb. Okay, I just took a bite. I gotta, right. I gotta re-up on my glass again, because I'm not smart. <laughs> Chris or maybe to, I am. You need to pour heavier, all right. Yeah. One thing I would also add there, Alicia, is that there is a middle tier in, from this winery called Flor de Pingus, which is maybe $80, $90. And if you're like a, yeah, a Cabernet fan, you want something that's, that's bold expression, but maybe a little uh, clearly, more clearly delineated and a little fresher. I, I mean, it's a great bottle to replace your high-end Napa cab with for something different. Yeah. Um, it'll definitely handle steak and any, you know, roast beef and things like that. Yeah. And I think it's about time that we all start drinking different wines. Mm -hmm. uh, so switch it up a little bit. And, and, you know, of these four, um, there is truly a, a wine for everyone to enjoy here um, as we've kind of progressed in terms of the weight and concentration of each of them. So lots to have. How is it with the lamb, Chris? Okay. So far, this is, this is winning. It's it's really good. It's fantastic. It, it works seamlessly with it. Um, the fruit still come, just like explodes through. The acidity is great. It cuts through any fattiness and the, the those spices just yeah. dovetail with the wine so nicely. Um, and I, I would just put a finer point on on the idea of drinking more broadly is, you know, I'm I'm an incredibly promiscuous drinker, as you may know. Um, if, if it's good, I'm, I'm interested. And uh, there are so many easy lateral shifts you can make. If you're stuck in a rut, talk to someone at Binnie's and, and we can say, if you like this, you're going to love this. And, and Rivera de Duero is a great region for doing that. It's, I, I can't say enough how easy it is to get people into these wines who are used to drinking domestic Cab or Merlot or Bordeaux. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so let's finish up here with our last wine, Maliolus 2017. Um, sorry, for some reason my lighting. There we go. Yeah. So that's Emilio Moro. It's hard. It's very hard to see, but sorry. That's okay. <laughs> it's uh, you know, it's now dark outside at this time, so uh, <laughs> use all this artificial light, but. Um, doesn't doesn't help sometimes, but uh, yeah. So family run producer here, three generations, I believe the um, the Moro family. This is now 100% um, Tempranillo or Tinto Fino uh, that we have here. And I like always tasted the wines before we came on, and this is my favorite. Um, this is absolutely divine. Uh, so eight yeah, maturation here on this one. So we see a little bit of a deeper color than the last. Sorry, Chris, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I was just going to say, Amelia Moro is just another well-known and high-quality producer that's clustered in there next to Pingus and uh, Via Creces and, and um, Pescara and, and uh, Vega Sicilia. So, um, and yes, they, they, it's family-run and great growing going way back, but a, a relatively, you know, as wine terms go, relatively new project. We're talking like 80s or 90s. Uh, before they started marketing their own wines. And by the way, Maliolus means, uh, is local uh, dialect for a small plot of grapevines. Okay. So. Uh, this to me has a cohesion, a, um, the dustiness of the tannins, the kind of earthy qualities along with, yes, the red fruit, but um, everything is just so kind of perfectly aligned with this wine and it is drinking beautifully now. Um, so, you know, open it, decant it for a little bit, but I also would love to see it in a few years. Um, I think there's a lot there and 
I think there's also what we didn't see on the other wines that I think kind of pops up a little bit here. There is kind of this slight kind of gamey, savory note uh, to this wine that I haven't seen yet. Yeah, uh, you're you're not wrong. This wine is fabulous. <laughs> it's really, really nice. Um, yeah, the 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 balance is impeccable. Impeccable, and the the weight of the fruit is it's more weighty than the others, but it's still super light on its feet. You know, there's nothing heavy or um, uh, too overripe about this in any way. It's just seamless, beautiful, great structure. Um, I think it's fantastic. I couldn't agree with you more about that. Um, I'm gonna try the lamb test. Okay, you try your lamb and while you do that and you can give us your final uh, verdict here and which of the four you like is the lamb. And again, we'll put that on the blog. Uh, I'll throw up here the wines that we had today. and just wanna thank everyone for joining us. Please explore Ribera del Duero. We think it's a region that a lot of people will love and um, you know, not enough people kind of shop it. So we need you to, to check it out. As Chris mentioned, a lot of parallels to these wines that uh, we know you'll really enjoy. Well, we've got a winner. It, it, I had to wait till the last one to find it though. They were, <laughs> they were all good. I, if I had any of these in isolation with this dish, I'd be very happy. But there's no doubt that the Maliolos uh, is killer. It's 2017 and you know you mentioned Alicia that um, there was a lot of frost and a lot of, a lot of damage in the vineyards that year but you know in addition to old vines that that can serve if it happens early enough to reduce yields dramatically naturally and I think that's what happened here I think we we ended up with a wine in it from a, a, a rough vintage but not a bad vintage just a difficult one that uh, yields were down in that is absolutely beautiful. Uh, great job they did. Yeah. Uh, well, Chris, thank you as always. Thanks for sharing your lamb uh, with us as well. And cheers. Cheers. Good night, Have everybody. A good, have a good night, all.